It's, uh, it's wonderful to be back in Singapore after three years away. It's been far too long, and it's wonderful to see everybody today and to be in person. So we're going to have a very unusual discussion today. We're going to talk about the cloud's role in national security and what we've seen evolve over the past 10 years. My previous job was at the Central Intelligence Agency in the United States, leading their digital transformation starting in 2015. And I made a lot of mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes. And so one thing I feel very passionate about is sharing my lessons learned and what we're seeing today in the national security conversation. But the most important thing from today that you need to remember, and if you don't remember anything else, because we're going to have some real practical advice, is thank you. So let me try this. Let's see. OK. Xie Ning, Maraming Salamat, Terry Makase, Arigato Gozaimas, Kamsa Hamida, Akun Tran, Kapkun Ka, Kam Un, Shokran, Jazilan, Shokriya. All right. So I hope I covered everybody in the room. So let's, let's talk about what, why, why did the United States intelligence community, with 17 agencies, why did they go to AWS Cloud? And the answer was because things were not working the way they, they had to. There were data leaks, large data leaks, 750,000 confidential and classified files were leaked because legacy networks could not be made secure. And more and more people needed data in the field. But it wasn't secure. We were missing. We were giving the wrong advice to US decision makers. In the case of Arab Spring, which was such a momentous movement, the ability to have capability at scale to analyze all the data that was coming in, the data that was coming in from the voice of the people, was not there. So lack of scale. And the third thing, and most, most upsetting to the senior leadership that looked out was 10 years after the tragedy of 9-11, the attacks on the United States in 2001, we said we were still, you know, people, individual missions working very hard said, you know, I'd love to share my data with this other mission. I'd love to share my data with this other office. I'd love to share my data with this analyst over here. But it turns out we're using all these separate computer systems, and they don't talk to each other. And the objective was eliminate that excuse, because the people we were sworn to defend would never accept that. So we fast forward 10 years, and what has happened is a huge validation of what the cloud has enabled us to do in national security in the United States and across the world with our partners across the world. So what do we see happening? In 2020, as a new president is preparing to take office in the United States, it's revealed that on-premises systems that were run by the government, where people thought it's on-premises, I can, there's a room with the servers in my building, so that makes it safer. They were pillaged. A massive cyber attack that specifically was designed to go after their feeling of it must be safe if, I can, if it's in my building. A supply chain attack that was designed to exploit the very thing that people were saying about why on-prem is safer. On -prem, uh, this was on-prem's last moment. To brief a new administration that, that more than a dozen agencies' data was being hijacked was the last moment for on-prem. What is the, the new administration in the United States has basically given two edicts that every agency must move to the cloud. All of US government must be in a cloud environment. The second thing we're seeing is critical infrastructure. Now, this is the calm, actually, before the storm. We're seeing more and more ransomware and other attacks on things that every citizen depends on their government to deliver. Power, water, banking, the things that we must have. Yes, they count on defense. Yes, they count on intelligence. But those critical infrastructure are the things that are the most. I, I recall being in Singapore when the wonderful and beautiful clean metro system you have here, I grew up in New York City, it's nowhere close to what you have here, was running late and it was the headline in the newspaper. It was, such a, it was, it was monitored so carefully. So the last thing is we live in very interesting times, very uncertain times. We are seeing 
a geopolitical uncertainty and events in the world that we did not think we would see again and haven't seen for more than 70 years. So some of the things that we've learned in the, in, in, in the national security space at AWS is it was said this morning better than I could say it. This is not a technical issue. It's culture. It's cultural. So my advice to you who are in the national security sector, wherever you are, and to those who have to work it is that it will take a lot of cultural, I'll call it cultural engineering. Now, I'm an electrical engineer by background. I did not have any coursework in cultural engineering. I'm also from New York City, which means I'm the wrong person to do that, right? So also, the mission impact has to be, this has to be a transformation, not a transition. You know, we had too many people saying, well, you know, the cloud thing, that's, I used to have a gray box on my desk, then I'll have a black box on my desk. That's not what it's about. You have to be very aggressive about getting rid of legacy. You cannot be nostalgic. Nostalgia is vulnerability. Nostalgia is from the Greek word for nausea. In the United States, we tend to be very nostalgic. We store our stuff in big storage units. Get rid of things. Get rid of, of aggressively get rid of legacy. So the other thing that I missed horribly, another mistake I made was every part of the organization needs to be involved in the transformation because they all benefit. The budget team, the logistics team, the admin team, the security team, they all benefit tremendously from the cloud. But if you don't bring them along from the beginning, it's a big mistake. And I made that mistake. I focused on, on the mission segments. I focused on getting a, a rapid transition, but I didn't bring the whole team in. Big mistake. Um, so, and here's the final thing. You've heard today examples of how fast things can move. It will stun and amaze people when you don't need a program that takes multiple years with coffee mugs. We call them coffee mug programs, CMPs. If someone orders a coffee mug with the logo of the program, it's too late. That means it's multiple years, it's gone through all this procurement process, and, and we, we, everybody said, okay, you know, cue the coffee mugs if we want to do, move from point A to point B, and what was remarkable was with AWS, what we found is we could do things over a weekend. Recently, a challenge came to us, a national security challenge, very, very pressing, uh, quite frankly, an emergency, and we said, we, we can help. And it was the highest levels of the US government. They said, the contractors have told us this will take two and a half years and cost this many million dollars. We did it in 40 hours. We did it in 40 hours for $38,000. This stuns people. They think it's, they, they, they can't get their head around it. They did not have time to order coffee mugs. And that's become my new metric. If you have enough time to order a coffee mug and get it made with a logo, then you're on the wrong schedule. You can go that fast. Now, here's some things that really surprised me. You look at this picture, you say, what's wrong with this picture? This, is, this was current picture. These were things I inherited. You look at this and it, 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 it's 2015, folks. You say, what's wrong with this picture? And I'll tell you, the very dedicated people that do the national security mission, no matter what country they're in, they said, nothing's wrong with this picture. And we said, well, okay. Um, what we didn't realize, what I failed to realize is, really good dedicated people in the public sector, the people who deliver every day for the constituency in the country, will defend a miserable existence will defend how much they struggle to get the job done with the tools they have. Why do they do that? Do they get up in the morning wanting to obstruct a transition, a transformation? Absolutely not. These are wonderful people. It's actually a sign of how devoted they are to the national security concern. They have been conditioned to accept a very, what I call digital drudgery, and they will actually defend it. So be ready for that. And the right messaging is, you deserve better. The right messaging is, I would like you to go home earlier at night to see your family. The right messaging is, you can stay here all night if you want, but I want it more intellectual time, the time that we paid you for, for your tradecraft, not the time needed to move data between systems and gather data. Another big mistake and another non-obvious thing was we had very senior meetings to make decisions about transforming and moving to the cloud. We call these elephant meetings. I was one of the elephants. 
So you get the elephants in a room, what happens? Well, like a herd of elephants, they all kind of bump into each other. Sometimes they poop on the floor and somebody has to clean it up. Right? So what happened in these elephant meetings was these were very amazing people who made important decisions all the time. Decisions affect their, they could, we could not get decisions out of this forum. So what we learned in the lesson for you is the preparation for these kind of decisions has to be done very differently. We, we learned that people did not understand cloud and, they, and, and there, is, there were very few elephants that raised their hand and said, excuse me, I don't understand a single decision I'm being asked to make. And by the way, they were again doing, the, they were doing what they're trained to do. They did not know what the risk is. And one speaker said it so well this morning, you have to quantify the risk. So preparing these senior leaders to make these decisions is a very different process when you're doing a transformation to the cloud. We came up with an education program that at first, you know, it didn't occur to me to do this at various levels, and we had very junior non-technical officers go in and brief the elephants one-on-one. -on -one. No elephant wants to lose face in front of another elephant. And so you don't send in technical people. You send in people who are really good at explaining things. And we sent some folks off to education programs, a one-week course at a local university in Washington, D.C. And they came back, and it was, it was as if there was a bright flash of light. And they said, I understand now why we're doing this. I understand the risk of not doing this. You must always characterize the risk and always respect the elephants. The next thing which surprised me is in 2005, there was a law passed in the United States by Congress that said all CIOs in a, a government organization have to have a direct line to the director of that organization. It's called the Klinger Cone Act. It's a small piece of legislation. What I learned very quickly and what I learned when I was consulting after leaving CIA in 2019 is that I met people who said, I'm in the C-suite, I'm the CIO, or I'm the CISO. Very, very few of them were in the real decision-making meetings. They had a big title. Sometimes they even sat on the same floor, we called it Mahogany Row, with the big bosses. But IT was thought of as an admin function. So in your transformation, one of the things we had to do, we, we had to change the whole pace system. We had to change, we changed the promotion system. We changed just about everything because we had folks who said, I do this thing called customer service, that's what I do. And I said, no, you don't, you do mission. And you don't have customers, you have mission partners. And we made sure and integrated, and it was tough. It was tough because when we took these very fine, amazing public servants, they were very nervous to be in these decision meetings. Whether it was overseas or whether it was at the headquarters of CIA, we had to put them in the decision process. And it amazed me how far removed they were from that decision process. So a couple trends, things we're seeing today. First of all, security. The security features that are in the commercial regions today are light years ahead of what we inherited at CIA in 2013. So consider this. The intelligence community in the United States runs its top secret data on the AWS cloud and has been doing that since 2013. That cloud is continually updated with new security features. The 10 years in digital time is 100 years of analog uh, progress. So we also have commercial customers that are as demanding and sometimes more demanding than the top secret national security customers. The world's wealth and health data runs in the AWS commercial regions. For those of you who have worked with banks, for those of you who have worked with healthcare systems, you know that years ago, there was a compromise of health data for leadership in Singapore. Major, major issue. People care about national security. They care about intelligence community. But boy, they really care about their money, their personal wealth, and they really care about the privacy of their health data. And they look to the governments to secure that. They have very demanding requirements. So, you know, one of the big lessons learned for us is 
we go to a country and they say, you know, I'm, you know, we're, we're considering our national security space moving to the cloud, but we're not sure. We're starting to have that conversation. We say, okay, by the way, your central banking runs on the cloud, the commercial cloud that's in your region. And so, uh, again, you know, moving very quickly. Uh, open source intelligence, OSINT. Um, the, the amount of data that's out there today that informs and lets us understand a situation as it evolves because so much of it is commercially available. It's in the public space. We can, uh, you can buy it. Um, you can sometimes get it for free. Making use of it, it's such an avalanche of data that it requires the very latest AI and ML capabilities that are found on the cloud. Without that, the normal processes come and say, well, there's a whole lot of data and we're not sure what it means. We sort of think it means this. Now, you remember that example I used up front. I, I showed Arab Spring, and the headline was Egypt, how the president was, was not given the right advice. The data is so massive now that it needs to be done with AIML, and that capability for artificial intelligence, machine learning, is being developed in the commercial regions at very low cost. Most of the, of the experience we have is that um, advanced graduate students uh, and, uh, a, a, quite frankly, a dispersed workforce is developing the tools that later feed private networks, top secret networks in the government. And it's being done today in the commercial regions. So another big lesson and something we missed, I certainly missed it, at CIA we have a, a wonderful Amazon dedicated cloud. To, to handle our top secret data. We needed to, we should have been, focusing on getting our skill base in the commercial cloud, and that's something you can do tomorrow. And the final point is, with all this uncertainty, there's been a huge emphasis now on digital resiliency. And digital resiliency is a lot more than redundancy. Redundancy usually means you have another copy of something to go to. Resiliency means the worst thing you can imagine happens, and that's, and according to some customers say, all these bad things could happen, we don't want the screen to flicker. We want this to be instantaneous, continuous, and truly resilient. And that's a very, very fascinating and exciting conversation to be having. So let's talk about how the world is working together and what di digital coalitions really mean. Now, we talk about digital coalitions. One national security advisor said it to me best. He said, in this world, it's bits. Bits are replacing, more and more replacing, battalions, buildings, battleships, bombers, bullets, and bombs. Instead, it's bits. And it has to happen at speed. So a little history of, of secure international command and control networks. You might have seen some of this stuff in the movies, the famous red phone. And it would and, and be depicted as the leader of, of one country and the leader of another world power. They would, if worse came to worse, and they were very worried about the national situation, a way to, to chill things out, a way to bring it down would be a voice call. This actually did exist. It was actually used to ensure that, that something terrible did not happen. So first we did it with voice. And then the system came along to send what was called a telex message. And we were able to archive the messages. So we were able to write things down from, from a, usually a secure communication center and send it to another government to make sure that nothing happened, or send it to a friendly government where we're trying to coordinate our activities. Then around 1996-ish kind of era, it became what were known as bilat systems, where there was a dedicated server, and this is a very legacy design, and basically, there could be an exchange of finished files, whether that was satellite imagery or intelligence reports. So this is where we need to go. In a world where the news cycle moves so fast that changing times demand the ability to have an instant digital coalition in national security, it has to be streaming data. It has to allow people to, to get in and have collaboration across different work groups in different countries. It needs to be set up over the course of hours. This can only be done in the cloud. It has to extend all the way to the field and all the way to the edge. This is what 
we must have for global national security because we are all riding on this planet together. Just as we must have a commitment to the environment, a commitment to sustainability, we also are in this together. And this is what defines it. Now, the challenge is, this is where we're stuck. Today, the environment is, well, we've got a system. We've had it for the last 10 years. We think it's secure. We're pretty sure. They told us it was secure. I'll get to that in a minute, by the way. That's my favorite topic. So um, you do remember, I used to work at CIA, so I, I love hearing that phrase. It's secure. <laughs> OK. So we think it's secure, but quite frankly, it's very limited. And again, what are we seeing? We're seeing that wonderful, dedicated people who love their countries are willing to accept something that isn't the optimal solution. You know, Nike had a great marketing phrase. At Mike, Nike, they would say, just do it. I would offer the phrase for, for AWS needs to be, just ask us. Because you heard today, 90% of the innovations that come up are driven by the customer saying, here's what I think I need. When I was the customer for AWS at CIA, we would have meetings of great importance on a Thursday. And by Tuesday, AWS was in saying, I've got three different demos to show you the way we think we can solve it. But you pick one. Uh, we want to get more information on you, work backwards from the problem. Uh, my, my big, one of my biggest challenges was to find a conference room in time. They would move that fast. Again, no coffee mugs. If you can order a coffee mug and get it printed, uh, you're going too slow. It could be faster. So, all right, three essential things to start now. You don't have to have a cloud to start these, but I've never, in my consulting time before AWS, I have never, ever, ever found an organization doing all three. Never. In fact, most just look at me blank stare when I talk. First is implement an enterprise strategy for data curation. Now, if I want to empty a room, I put up in the lecture that the discussions could be data curation. And unless there was somebody who was a university researcher, I can use it. There, there's, there's nobody in that room, right? It, it's pretty, it sounds pretty stale. We love our data. We care about our data. We treat it like our DNA. We treat it like our, our, our lifeblood. But we're not sure where it is. We're not sure how old it is. And by the way, we have compliance requirements. We have privacy requirements. We should be able to discover the data. So having a data strategy is absolutely essential. And it's hard work, but it's worth it. It talks about how you curate data, how you tag it when you get it, the life cycle of the data. In the cloud, you can tell who's touched the data, how long the data's been there, when was the last time somebody added to it. All those things are instant. They're with a few keystrokes. Doing it manually is, is nowhere. The great thing about it is it vastly improves your mission decisions. We made great friends within the agency I did when people started to be able to show up with incredible data to make a decision for a meeting. The HR folks, who I hadn't spent a lot of time working with them thinking cloud, they, they were able to show up and say, here's the database of, here's who we think is the right person for this, here's what their background is, here's how many people, are, here's where people are successful with this, here's what languages they have, everything. Real hard data. It makes better decisions. Next thing, map the digital workflow across the enterprise. Within a mission, they'll tell you how the operations work. I spent 29 years in US Air Force. I spent 27 years at CIA. I knew my missions. I was very proud of that. I could explain the operational mission, but I usually didn't know what became before it, where the tasking came from, and I usually didn't know what came after it after I collected the data, quite frankly. I focused on my part. So when you start to do this and you map the digital workflow, you find the vulnerabilities. You find the digital drudgery. You find where, where those wonderful people that you care about are being asked to do Herculean things every day to get the job done. And we had a lot of examples of where we tightened that down from, we had one where it was 16 separate digital workflows down to four. We didn't get it down to one. We got it down to four. What happened? A lot better accuracy, which really counts, a lot fewer mistakes, and much less vulnerability. So the third thing is, and I mentioned legacy already. You're going to hear me beat on this one again. Inventory assess and triage legacy systems. Now, here's what's going to happen. You're going to say, how many legacy systems do we have? And I think Singapore's got a great plan. We heard it this morning. They've got a plan to get off of 70% of legacy. By the way, and the leadership here gets it, right? But with legacy, people will come in and say, we say, OK, how many of these can you retire? How many can you retire? And they say, oh, 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 
We can't retire this. We're depending on this. How many people are using it? Oh, critical. Critical, uh, 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 I'm sure a, a lot of people. We, we couldn't audit how many people are actually using some of these systems. We actually didn't, it takes a while to figure out how many you actually have. But the number you're going to get at first to retire is going to be very, very low. And I love the number I heard today, 70%. I would offer it has to be up at about that range. The number I got at CIA was a single digit, single digit number, okay? And we, we had some really old stuff. And they said, well, in one case, somebody said, well, we're going to retire the system, but we, we, we got to retire a few people first. They're using it. So after they leave, you know, we can, you can have it then. So uh, that shouldn't be the measure. That shouldn't be the metric. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that are really expensive if you want to rehost them because they aren't being used and it's not the best use of the cloud. So this, this legacy thing to me is really about, it, it's about behavior. It's no one trying to obstruct, but it's about trying to get people past the conditioning they've had in the public sector. This is my favorite part. Okay. On the worst day that the cloud has, when everything fails and people make bad decisions, the cloud is more secure than any legacy system out there. And this is a conversation we love having because it's work that's never finished. We're always improving security. And this is a conversation I would fly anywhere in the world to go have. People ask about cloud security, I say, okay, let's go. This is what we did. So let's see, 10 years of this and a lot of track record and a lot of uh, being fortunate to have the cyber team under me at CIA as well as the defense team. So the offense and defense together in one organization. This cloud's tough. It's the best thing out there on its worst day. And anytime we want to have the conversation, I will gladly go to wherever you are. So, a network is stood up. When it's stood up on the first day, it might be pretty secure. The day one. But this is the problem. If it's important, you have to keep updating it and patching it. Yet it gets connected to other stuff, especially if it's important. It gets connected. At first, you say, uh, I, okay, here's, here's a word that makes no sense. Isolated network. That's like jumbo shrimp. They're, they're just... There's no logic. There is no thing. If two machines are hooked together, that is, that is not an isolated network. Or they say it's isolated, it's only in this building. And the next thing you find out, they say, well, can you log into it from overseas? Well, yeah, because we needed it. If it's doing important, something important, it ends up getting hooked to other stuff. Um, it, it ends up, the configuration of it, which, you know, the equipment wears out, so the configuration ends up changing. And as more supply side issues hit, that configuration is tougher to map. And then finally, it doesn't have the required audit and monitoring that you need because we need to know how the systems are performing. And you have a responsibility, as I did at, at CIA, a responsibility to tell the stakeholders um, what, what people are doing on the system. So it might be okay on day one, but by day two, it's in tough shape already. And we run into legacy systems, say, they say, this was approved. We had uh, authority to operate. When was that authority to operate? Seven years ago. I'd ask you, do any of you carrying around a seven-year-old phone? If you are, my strong suggestion is to throw it in the wood chipper and get a new one. There's no way to keep it secure, even with all the patches that happen every Tuesday. Now, sophisticated audit with AI and ML, you can't do this with people looking for predicates anymore. All that data running in the background will tell you things about how the data is being used. Is someone trying to get to data who shouldn't be? Is someone, did someone come in this weekend and print out 2,000 pages and they've never been in on a weekend and they were never printed anything out? That might be an indicator that, of something. But, but it will give you insights into how the system is being used. It can give you insights into how your workforce is working. Who's overworked? What section of the workforce is putting in all these long hours? Are they, are they subject to burnout? Because we need to take care of our people. And we learned that during COVID. And everybody needs more people. This is also about control, speed, and security at the edge. Because most people are not in a headquarters environment. Now, this is an example of where 
I, I would go into tactical environments in very tough places, and I would see amazing people, whether they were Americans or partners of other countries, with three or four different terminals on their desk trying desperately to do their job, trying to, to create an analytical package to maybe make operational decisions. And quite frankly, you know, after you wrestle away from them that, you know, you could have, what if you just had it all on one screen? And they say, is it a big screen? Yes, we'll give you a really big monitor, but we'll have the whole digital workflow in one, and you'll be the master of it. And we'll buy you back two hours a day. So in the UK, they had several different systems that they were trying to hand integrate to track space objects. And AWS, um, led by one of our partner contractors, uh, basically, in very short time, integrated those feeds to be able to track, not only track space objects with all these different systems that had developed over time, but also a system that was flexible enough to add in additional new feeds. So think of it as getting from many screens one. The F-35, the most advanced fighter aircraft in the world, Singapore by the F-35. So the F-35, is an amazing software machine with wings. It just happens to have wings and, a, and an engine. But you reload the mission using software. It collects a lot of information. It spews a lot of information. It is a information platform. And it has lots of people involved in, in carrying out a mission. And this one's very close to my heart. Uh, so we've worked with Lockheed, the supplier of this system, and all of these partners to be able to have a ecosystem of software that allows the plane to be updated in days for what used to take years. Now, I'll tell you, my time in the Air Force, I always, when I got into a cockpit, I looked at, there's a little plate in the cockpit that tells you when the plane was built, with the year. And my goal was to minimize the number of aircraft that were older than me. And so now, the F-35, basically, you can upgrade and change the aircraft in the span of a weekend. That's where we are. That's what we're able to do in the cloud. And by the way, there's, there is, a speaker did a really good job today talking about what do we mean about multi-cloud environments? Well, what we mean is that there's going to be things that are secret. There are going to be things that are not classified. And what multi-cloud... Uh, is in some people's minds is, well, let's just divide up the work evenly between different cloud providers because, you know, a cloud's a cloud. I actually had somebody very senior in the U.S. say that to me at one time. Cloud's a cloud. I said, boy, you couldn't, be more, you couldn't be more wrong. You absolutely could not be more wrong. So a cloud is not a cloud. No two clouds are like. And then there's only, you know, if you think about it, hyperscale cloud is what we're talking about here. So... I, one of my jobs at CIA was to build CIA's first cloud. Now, it was a huge failure. I made a lot of mistakes in my life. I gave a briefing recently, and somebody says, you seem to make a lot of mistakes. How did you keep a job? And I said, I, I guess they, 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 they wanted somebody who would, who would take a punch and keep going, somebody who was resilient enough to say I could make a mistake. But I, we, built the, we tried to build the first cloud, uh, the year was 2000, and uh, it was 10 by then, 2010, and we failed. We failed because we did everything to it that neutered it and made it not a cloud. It just became a big, expensive data center. So, next. So, speed, again, I think this is the thing that really, really was the toughest thing for folks to accept, was that they could leave on a, on a Friday night and come in on Monday and things were different, fundamentally different in a digital sense. We would, we, we would especially love three-day weekends in the United States. We would take very complex, high-performance computing loads and move them to the cloud over a three-day weekend. And we'd get notes from people like saying, oh, we're uncertain about moving to the cloud with this. We're like, okay, okay. And we'd, we'd tell them about six months later, hey, you've been, you've been on the cloud for six months. There's been no downtime. There's been no glitch. There's been no hang time. And, and by the way, your private network it was, was $12 million a year. This has cost you about $3,800. So for Ukraine, we're very proud of the fact that at AWS, we have moved 10 
petabytes of data out of Ukraine. What is this allowing? This is allowing research to be archived and continue to go, and continue to be being done. Um, this has allowed uh, education to continue. This has enabled Ukraine's largest bank to continue to operate. Again, remember, what happens when someone goes, you, you goes to the ATM and none of the ATMs are working? That's a fundamentally bad day. So all that's working. And the other thing is, it has captured all of the land and sovereignty records for the, when the Ukrainians go and take back this territory that's been seized. And that's all preserved. 10 petabytes today and probably more coming. Uh, this next one, I actually have this on stage. So it's about the size of an iPad, it's thicker. And this is cloud, we call this snow cone. So that last one was snowball. Uh, this is snow cone. And so snow cone, we qualified this from it with working with a partner, Axiom, from the time we had the idea to do it and, it, and there was a mission need, to the time it was certified for man-rated space flight on the International Space Station, seven months. Now, seven months isn't an over a weekend kind of thing, but I will tell you, uh, man-rated, getting a manned flight rating for space hardware in seven months is really incredible. The normal schedule would be seven years. So these are very rugged devices. Um, you see it already has a mailing label on it. So when they, the answer is when you're done, you're done in space, using the compute, using cloud compute in space, and not having to send data back and forth, which takes a lot of time and a lot of bandwidth, you can actually drop it in, in, in a UPS uh, box and it gets, to, it gets to the destination. It has a prepaid mailer on it. This is what people expect. We have other edge devices that are being developed. So I wanna close out by asking a favor. Um, I want you to think about you know, what you can do to take advantage of AWS certification, take advantage of some of the skills courses we have. These are things you can do tomorrow. I, I think the importance of communicating in this kind of forum is what are some practical things to be done tomorrow? The other thing is I wanna, I wanna finish the way I started and thank you for my patience, your patience as I, I did. I want to recognize the languages we have in the room and, the, and for the attendees here, which I'm honored to be here and honored to be back in this region. I missed it so much. So I wanna say uh, again, thank you. And I would really appreciate feedback. It makes us better. It's what we always want to have. It's what drives us. We are customer obsessed. And the feedback you leave uh, about this briefing, about anything about it, about this session will be invaluable to us. You, there's a fantastic team, AWS team here in Singapore. You saw some of the folks today. It, there, there's a lot of the folks that are here today in this session. Uh, they are my heroes. They do a great job. Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon.